welcome back to Alice Talks Football and welcome back to a live Manchester United news takeover transfer news and update show. Lots and lots to discuss. Jim Ratcliffe versus Qatar 2.0. Qatar speak out. Qatar taking legal action against Ratcliffe and Manchester United and say they bidded £7 billion for the club. What's going to happen? Why are lawyers getting a we will be discussing that. But before we discuss that, a training error has been exposed in James Ducker's recent sort of report. We know obviously about players concerning about sort of the training intensity, but Manchester United also do not have fitness coaches among more, showing how badly the club is run and how much Ineos have got to change. Manchester United are in contact to apparently sign a 19-year-old from South America. They're exploring the price and negotiating to see if he would be good value for money, Mason Mount to return to Stamford Bridge tonight. Evans and Varana passed their late fitness test and they travel down to Chelsea. Who is in the Manchester United lineup versus Chelsea tonight? What is the news ahead of that match? All will be discussed in today's live show. So please do that like button. Of course, subscribe down below if you're new <clears throat> and share the video. Let's get up on and on with our first story, people, as well. Um, let me get into the story here. Someone said, I don't like Eric Tenog's comments about Mount going to cause Mount trouble. What did Tenog say about Mount again? Hmm. What did he say about Mount again? I can't, I can't remember. I know but he said something. Let me, let me, let me search up. Tenog, Mount. Um, Tenog said on Mason Mount, um, I'm happy for him, I'm, but I'm also sorry for him. He deserved that moment. Maybe it was a short moment, but for a player who suffered from so many injuries, he's worked hard. It was so frustrating. He's just, I think, is he, that what you talk about? Just talking about feeling sorry for Mason Mount. Um, he said that I don't think Chelsea wanted to sell Mason Mount. They offered him a new contract. Um, and he said that Mason Mount's time will come. He's obviously just come back from injury, so there's no guarantee he starts. Um, but I think Mount and Tenog have quite a good relationship, all in all. I'll, I'll look more into that later as well. Um, he's basically saying that Mount forced to move, which to be fair, Mount doesn't like because Mount was trying to because Mount was annoyed that it was tried to be portrayed by Chelsea media that he left for money. So I, I guess that he might not like that as well. And the kickoff <laughs> is 8.15. Yeah. Do you know what though? It's really annoying because as a content creator, when you're covering two games, you've got to wait 45 minutes for the first game to end to then cover the second game. But yeah, 8.15 tonight. I should be live for a watch along. Let's get into the content. So the first story here is this. Some Manchester United players have harboured concerns about the volume of high intensity training sessions between matches and privately expressed fears the approach may have contributed to this team's injury issues. Now, this has been a present issue since the start of the season. This is something that only came out in leaks when we started losing. But this apparently, and according to sources, that, that the players said this before pre-season, in pre-season, the beginning of the season, before things went bad, players were saying this. And then obviously it gets leaked after we lose, leaked after a bad result because then the media can get more hits on it. But this has been a problem of concern all season. I think part of the problem is the players, the players' laziness, the players' lack of athleticism. But I also think when you look at Manchester City, you look at Liverpool, they do a lot of tactical work in the week. I do think that we need to do some adaptions to our weekly training, maybe focus more on tactics and what we're trying to achieve rather than intense training sessions. Because if you look at the way Tenag wants to play, there's a lot of space that needs to be covered. The players need to run a lot if they want to play the way Tenag wants to play. And they seem to be using up their energy midweek. I'll give the players a little bit of the benefit of doubt with that. I'm not, I don't think, you know, fixing training is going to stop injuries, but I think that potentially the intensity of training and then the demand to turn off to play isn't quite working for our players because one, lack of fitness, but two, um, the training, it means they're less fit for the matches ahead. I think, I do think these team, this team is unfit. I do think the physical ability of this team is shocking, um, but I do think that, you know, we need to change our training regime but I think the biggest problem, which was mentioned by James Ducker, is here down below. And that is that Manchester United are one of the very few top level clubs who do not employ a fitness coach. And that could change under Ineos with the performance of this and psychological provision. One of the areas under review who favours the appointment of a performance director. The fact that we do not have a performance coach, the fact that we do not have a fitness coach is crazy. When you think of the intensity of the Premier League, when you think of how intense the Premier League is, how it requires probably the most running and the most athleticism of any league. And Manchester United, the club's biggest Manchester United, do not have a fitness coach. That is mad. And I want to show you a quote that was made by Pep Guardiola. 
uh, about his first season at Manchester City to just explain how mad that is. And I think you might find this quote a little bit interesting, guys. Let me get this up for you here. This is a quote and in regards to Pep Guardiola. Only it, once in his career, Pep made a mistake. In his first year at Man City, when he completely underestimated the power and speed of the Premier League, Tenog told um, well, the Football International, he realised that you can't play the kind of football he loves without having a, a couple f physically strong athletes. And so he brought them in so he's not a stubborn coach. And this was said by Ten Hag on Pep Guardiola. Pep's first season at Manchester City wasn't the best, but that's because he realised in the Premier League you need players that are physically and athletically real athletes. And that's what Pep went and did the, the following season. He brought in real athletes. And Ten Hag said he's not stubborn. He's realised it's not working in the Premier League because he's not the players, he's not the fitness, the athleticism of the players. And he brought in athletes. So it's interesting. You know, well, Manchester United are going to bring in some athletes, some Amadou Anana type player. Because I think, while I think Ten Hag's definitely getting things wrong tactically, and I think the display versus Brentford was dreadful, I also have sympathy for Ten Hag because I think if Ten Hag, Ten Hag can't physically play good football with this squad, and Ten Hag can't physically play the football he wants to play with this squad because they're not athletically good enough. It's a multitude of things of, yes, Ten Hag's tactics are poor, but also when you look at the athletic quality of the squad, it is absolutely shocking. Fatigue, lethargic performances and injuries, what could be causing it? It was obvious to any medic last season. It's a mixture of things. It's a mixture of, you know, lack of staff, lack, you know, incompetent people in the medical team. Uh, we don't have a performance director. We don't have a fitness manager. I think the intense training, I think the players are a little bit unfit as well. I think it's a multitude of many things as well. Austin says they're not unfit, they're lazy. I think some of them are unfit, some of them are lazy. I think it's a little bit of a mix. And I think some of them are just absolutely knackered. Like Bruno Fernandes is not unfit and Bruno Fernandes is not lazy. But Bruno Fernandes is probably absolutely exhausted. Would not be nice to see Mano Neves and Mount in midfield. Bruno has potential to become a super sub. I think that Bruno is someone that is good enough to start week in, week out for Man United and the title challenging side if we get the best out of him. You look how good he is for Portugal. Currently, we're not getting the best out of Bruno Fernandes. And I'll tell you that for a fact, in my opinion, this well, we don't know which United or which Chelsea will show up today. Both teams are definition of inconsistent. You know what? I think Manchester United versus Chelsea tonight. Um, and I'm going to get into the other news in a second, a Qatar story in a second. But I think Manchester United versus Chelsea tonight is definitely one of the most interesting games of the season because Manchester United and Chelsea have had similar seasons. They've had some shocking performances, some shocking games, and they've also had moments where they've looked quite good. I think Chelsea have probably had more good games than us this season. But we have more quality than Chelsea, so we can win games when we play bad. I think Man United and Chelsea have both had good games, bad games, both been inconsistent. But if Man United show up and play their best, we know what we're capable of. If Chelsea show up and play their best, they can also be quite good. Now, we ran loops around Chelsea, you know, in the home game. But I think it will be different away from home. I know what we're kind of like away from home. Ten Hag is, you know, at home is more like to sort of press high and cause problems. I think Ten Hag is going to play very passive in this Chelsea game. And I think it's going to be boring. And I think Chelsea might fancy themselves, which is a little bit worrying. Um, but yeah, you, you make a point. I think Manchester United versus Chelsea is definitely going to be one of the most interesting games. Ten Hag could be gone at the end of the season if, if this week result goes against him. If we lose to Chelsea and lose to Liverpool, it wouldn't look good for Ten Hag's future. Apparently, Ten Hag has met Rat Ratcliffe and pleaded with Ratcliffe to give him time and is trying to convince Ratcliffe to give him time. It's one report that we will cover later on in the show. Uh, bad management is not down to Ten Hag. Uh, there's a multitude of things. I'm Ten Hag in. I support Ten Hag. I want players gone. I want good recruitment in before before we even think about sacking Ten Hag. I think that Ten Hag potentially training being intense and not focusing on tactical work might be an issue. But I also think the players are an issue. I also think the management above Ten Hag and above the players is an issue. The recruitment is an issue. I think there's so many issues at United that it's not about changing one thing and something being fixed. You can't change one thing and the injury crisis is fixed. You can't change one player and we're going to play good. You know, I see a lot of fans saying, you know, get Rashford off, get Rashford off. We'll never be a top club until Rashford leaves and then Rashford's off the pitch for 30 minutes or Rashford misses a game through injury and we're still just as bad because it's not about, oh, if we get rid of Rashford, it will solve our problems like some people think. You know, if we get rid of Ten Hag and Nagelsmann comes in and we will not be able to play Nagels and Ball with the proper players that we have. Tactically, we might be better, we might be more aware, but these players will not be able to replicate anything that Nagelsmann wants to do if he comes in. And can Nagelsmann man manage the United squad? We want to see good football. We need, good, we need the players to play good football. I think 
I'd understand if Vinny was sat in on because of the performance at Brentford, because of the performance at Fulham, how bad it was. But I also think if you do get a new manager in, they're not going to make any changes until the players go, until we actually get some organisation in our training plan, in our fitness. We need our players to be fitter. We need we need our players to understand tactics, but we actually need the players that are capable of doing that as well. There's a multitude of things. I will get into my lineup for today later on in the show. The Glazers are the biggest problem. 100% the Glazers are the biggest problem at the club. Um, and we're going to talk about that now. So, yeah, let's get into the next news stories. Let's get into the reports going about. So, I've just realised I'm on the wrong screen. I wanted to talk about Qatar. I wanted to talk about the report. I've got the wrong screen up here. Can you see that now? I think you can see that. This is the next story going about. Legal representatives of Sheikh Yassim have sent letters to Manchester United lawyers in New York City and London to complain about a pattern of demonstration, demonstrably false and defamatory statements made by Surgeon Ratcliffe about their attempt to buy the club. This has come from the very credible Adam Grafton. He said... They argue that the 92 Foundation provided definitive proof of funds via a demand guarantee from the Qatar National Bank. Evidence has been seen that a senior executive from the QMB wrote to Man United to confirm the ability of the, the 92 Foundation fund to purchase the club and clear the club debt. Continuing on, Sheikh Yassim's legal correspondence says that the 9-2 Foundation made its fifth and formal offer for Manchester United on the 1st of June 2023, where it compromised a bid of $5 billion to buy out the club's shareholders and a further $731 million to clear the debt, bringing together an enterprise worth $5.8 billion, which is about £5 billion. But then they pledged a further £1.3 million investment into the club, which they would argue would bring it to an overall beyond £7 billion transaction for United. But that is still short of the Glazers' £6 billion price mark. So let's go back into this. Let's go back into what this might mean and what could be to come of this. So basically, if you don't know, if you don't know the context... Qatar versus Ratcliffe. That was going on for a good year of basically fake news. Let's be honest. Qatar versus Ratcliffe, this, that, this, that, this, that. There was bids happening. The Glazers ultimately didn't want to sell. They wanted the minority stake and they played Ratcliffe into doing that. Qatar offered $7 billion, which is just under £6 billion, for a full sale clearing the debt and pledged investment. If I was the Glazers, I would have accepted that. I would have completely sold the club, but they didn't. The club went to Ratcliffe. What happened recently, a couple of months ago, is that Ratcliffe and the Glazers were implying that Qatar were never serious. They were using United's PR. They were using United to boost their country's image. They never wanted to buy United. They never actually presented proof of funds. And Qatar didn't actually have the money to buy United. It was all a game. It was all PR to play us fans. That was sort of what was presented by the media that was apparently edged on by Ratcliffe and the Glazers. Now, could that be a PR spin story by Ratcliffe and the Glazers to put out a couple of days after Ratcliffe buys the club? And we know that it's only a minority sale, so he's keeping the Glazers here to, you know, calm people down because I think a lot of people want a Qatar. I think a lot more people want a Qatar than Ratcliffe. I'm happy that Ratcliffe has come in and he's making changes with Omar Barada and Dan Ashworth. And I think, you know, I've been impressed with what Ratcliffe's intentions are so far. But of course, I can only judge Ratcliffe in a couple of the years to see the long term impact of what he's going to do. And I think Ratcliffe has surprised me. He's got sporting control. He's got sporting power. And I think bringing in Omar Barada is great. He looks like he's going to be making the changes that need to be made. He's made a lot of contact with the club. And I can't really be too critical of Ratcliffe just yet, despite being someone that wanted guitar but I think in the moment when we first got Ratcliffe a lot of us were disappointed because this was the Glazers staying now the Glazers are staying that is done but I think that Ratcliffe is obviously and Brailsford and Blanc I don't mind the control of the club because I think they're the right minds to get us back to the top but obviously at the time we weren't sure about that obviously Omar Barada coming in news about what Ratcliffe's trying to do has filled me with a lot of confidence that I didn't have originally when I thought oh the Glazers have played back we're going to buy 25 percent the Glazers won't give up control it looks like the Glazers will give up control but at that moment in time everyone was a bit upset I think everyone wanted Qatar everyone had that full sale idea in their head like oh we can actually get a full sale here this will be massive we can actually get a full sale here um and then obviously we found out it was going to be Ratcliffe and I think there was a lot of upset in the United community. And then a couple of weeks later, there was loads of reports coming out that actually 
Qatar were never interested in buying United. They use United as PR. They're using United to promote their image. They never presented the money. They never had proof of funds. And it was slamming Qatar. And even Ratcliffe made comments like, does Sheikh Yassim exist? Star Qatar real? When they were serious about buying United, that's what's been put out in the media that oh, Qatar never had the money to buy United. They didn't want to buy United. And it was all a game. Qatar are raging by that. Qatar are fuming by that. Because Qatar basically said, look, we put in a bid of $5 billion and a further $731 million to clear the debt. We gave you the $5.7 billion asking price, and then we said we'd invest a further $1.3 billion in the club. So in total, we were willing to spend $7 billion on the club, and Qatar said that they presented that, but the Glazers just basically ignored that. I think it's a situation of... I don't know the situation with Qatar, but I think it's a situation of the Glazers never wanted full sale. I look back at the whole takeover process, and I think... They used Qatar to get what they wanted out of Ratcliffe because Ratcliffe wanted the full sale and he realised he could not compete with Qatar for a full sale financially. And they realised that they could use Ratcliffe, who'd be willing to buy 25%. Um, basically, they could use Ratcliffe to get what they want, which is minority. You've got to remember in 2018, Manchester United announced they were looking for minority shareholders. They never got that, so they announced the full sale, but open to minority. They only got offers for the full sale and then played Ratcliffe into a minority. I think this was all a game from the Glazers. Qatar have come in with these big bids. Let's see if we can use this to get what we want out of Sergeant Ratcliffe. That, that's what I generally think. I think a lot of it was games from Qatar as well. Um, not games from Qatar, games from the Glazers. Joel Glazer just wants a Super League. I just think we knew that Joe and Avram Glazer never wanted to sell United. We knew the other four siblings wanted to sell, but Joe and Avram didn't. I think Joe and Avram knew that Qatar had the money, knew that Ratcliffe couldn't beat Qatar if he wanted the full sale, and told Ratcliffe the only way he can buy the club is if he agrees to do this, this, and this, and give them a load of money for 25%, and then eventually buy them out so they can profit and make more money out of United, which is an absolute disgrace, but you can't put anything past those Glazer scum as well. Would the Qataris have been as far forward uh, with background staff recruitment? I don't know. Obviously, could, you know, I think that Ratcliffe's done a good job with Ashworth, Omar Barada and potential people coming in. We're going to talk about a few other names. I don't know what it'd been like with Qatar and I actually, you know, I was quite upset when we originally got Ratcliffe because it was not because of Ratcliffe, but because of the full sale. I was saying this isn't the full sale we wanted. We sort of had this dream of Qatar, full sale, debt being cleared, and it almost sounded too good to be true. And maybe elements of it was PR, maybe elements, of course, of it was PR. But some elements of it did feel, oh, OK, that's a little bit too good to be true, or this or that, or this or that. Um, but I, I, I don't know what Qatar had done if they came in. I don't think the Ratcliffe's um, put foot wrong. I think when Ratcliffe was first announced, I was a bit worried you know, Glazer's still here, and I thought Qatar, you know, with their clearing the depths, do good to be true, but I think that Ratcliffe's done a decent job so far, but of course, you can only judge him really in the long term, I don't think you can judge him off this summer, it's off the next summer and the summer after when long-term things come in place. We've got 300 people watching, guys, so please do that. hit that like button if you haven't already, and of course, subscribe down below if you're new. I don't think it'll be long before Ratcliffe's majority shareholder, and I do want to talk about that majority shareholder. So, obviously, Qatar then put in around a $7 billion bid, which I still think was short because pledge investment needs nothing. Even if there's $1.3 million, which is $1 billion in pledged investment, that will mean nothing to the Glazers because that money doesn't go to them. So, really, it's, it, that takes $1.3 billion off it. Qatar probably gave $6 billion. They won the £6 billion, pounds, um, which is ridiculous that they rejected this bid. I still think to this day that Qatar offered, if this is true, and they're getting lawyers in to prove it's true, and Qatar offered this kind of money and the Glazers rejected it, I think that is silly from the Glazers. Maybe because I wanted a full sale and I wanted the Glazers gone, but I think that's a lot of money to reject. However, that being said, Ratcliffe's given a lot of money for 25%, and he's going to eventually buy them out more. I think in three, four years' time, the Glazers could be gone and Ratcliffe could buy them out. The problem is there's no guarantee of that. With Qatar, you knew the Glazers were going. With Ratcliffe, we don't know. But I have a feeling that Ratcliffe will be majority owner someday. I do agree as well. When the Glazer thing at least things will get better for sure. 100%. Avram Glazer makes my skin crawl. Hideous man. He is absolutely hideous. Qatari should have messed about with debt clearing and investments in the community and club. They could have dealt with that later on. 100%. I think one of the reasons Ratcliffe won is not just because the, the Glazers probably wanted a minority sale all along, but Ratcliffe knew he was dealing with. Ratcliffe knew he was dealing with the Glazers. He knew that they were businessmen. He knew they were money first. He knew that the Glazers aren't going to care about him clearing the debt and what he does with the money and what he spends it on and all of this and that. He knew that the Glazers aren't going to care about pledged investment or clearing the debt and what they spend the money on when he takes up the club 
the glazers just care about the figure on the number, the, the figure on the table and then the, the amount of money they're getting. That's what the glazers care about. And Ratcliffe knew that he was dealing with the glazers. He knew when from his time of dealing with Abramovich trying to buy Chelsea that he has to get on with the owner if he wants a better chance of selling the club. So he understood the owner that was selling the club, established a good relationship with him and understood that, you know, this owner wants as much money as possible you know what there's no point putting pledged investments in or saying you're going to clear the debt in your bid because the glazers aren't going to care about that and maybe qatar underestimate the glazers there didn't realize how selfish and greedy the glazers were i'm not sure but i think that did cause um qatar problems abram's nearly 70 she retires his guys exactly as well club indicated to bid as that 35.25 would be considered club uh reiterated that manchester united's promo focus was negotiating full sale that's what they said I think it was a gain to get Sir Jim Ratcliffe to pay what they eventually wanted. How could Sir Jim Ratcliffe buy the club in three years? Uh, when do you know? Uh, when when do you have the money now? Three years when when you do have the money now, unless it's debt wiped off and the club um, will never be where it needs to be. Qatar in. Sorry, I completely misread that. I think Sir Jim Ratcliffe will eventually buy the club out, but it will take a few years. It will take time. I think the Glazers want to be there a couple more years to rinse a bit more money out of the club as well. Glazers couldn't have cared less if Qataris took us to administration and played matches on the moon. All about money, 100% as well. And even now, Qatar are doing PR stuff. Clearing the debt and investment was not uh, what they were bidding for. We are, we're a PLC. They were bidding for shares. And I think the problem with Qatar is... Qatar did go with that PR approach. They told everyone they're going to invest in this, they're going to invest in this, they're going to clear the debt, they're going to do this, this and that. And that got the fans on their side, whereas Ratcliffe didn't do that. But actually, it doesn't get the Glazers on their side because Qatar's talking about all these brilliant things they're going to do when the Glazers leave. And it's like, well, yeah, but that's not going to allow the Glazers to profit off that. So I think that is definitely where Qatar went wrong there as well. I don't think that Qatar understood the Glazers at all. Um, and I don't think they understood that they couldn't care less about the club. I agree with Alex there. I do want to get into the next story as we've got a lot to talk about. And that is Ineos's plan. It's not going to be Qatar. $7 billion was rejected. It's going to be Ineos. But I think at first I was very upset when we didn't get Qatar. Now I'm feeling a lot more positive and bright about the Ineos future. And this was one of the things said, Ineos's plan. It was said that Ineos are looking for someone that could organise and manage talent across a multi-club model. One of the potential names that has been brought up for the role is Hugo Viana, who is the director of Sporting Club de Portugal. Now, Sporting, who's their manager? Amorim. Who did they sign in the summer? Jokeres. Sporting's recruitment these last few years have been unbelievable because they've lost key players like Nunes and Agate in the field and Amarin's managed to adapt and still get them in the title race and probably win them the title this season. Sporting's recruitment, Sporting's general work recently has been fantastic. And Manchester United not only want Dan Ashworth, not only want Jason Wilcox and Elmer Brad there, not only do they want maybe someone to work in recruitment, but they also want someone to manage the multi-club tap model. Um, and Manchester United want this talent across their multi-club model. They sign up a Fundi for Lausanne. They want to sign young players at United and loan them out to Nice. They want to sign young players to develop at Nice and potentially sell them to United for the cheap. And they want someone to be the coordinator of that. And Hugo Viana is who they picked out. Now, Hugo Viana has a good reputation of brilliant scouts across the South Americas and across just the, the globe, bringing in some great players for Porto on some decent money, bringing in some great young talent. So I think if Hugo Viana is the guy that is looking across the South American market, saying Ineos should bring this guy in, maybe buy him for Nice, and then maybe if he's good, we can sell him to Man United later on for a cheap, or Man United should buy this guy and load him to the Son on Nice. Ineos are basically wanting someone that's going to look around for all the best talents for them to sign, all the best young talents, a little bit like Real Madrid done with Endrick, to potentially sign for United or sign for another one of those clubs with the intention of maybe one day they'll be United level. As Gaz says, guys, please do hit that like button. And of course, Subscribe down below if you're new. Ineos do need to sort out these execs already. Only uh, only appointment so far as CEO. We're nearly five months in. I mean, Dan Ashworth and Jason Wilcox is done. It's just a matter of getting the gardening league sorted. I think one of their gardening leagues will be sorted, but I think the other could drag on. But at the end of the day, Newcastle won't want to be paying Dan Ashworth eight wages. I think they might just give him and agree to a lower gardening fee. But I do like that Ineos are looking to bring someone in to oversee Man United, Lisa Lassan, and that young talent network that connects them. Because talking of young talents, the player that we're reportedly looking at and are thinking about signing is uh, Palmeiras. And they want to, and Man United have inquired about, what have I, I've, I've lost my mind. They've contacted, I've lost my mind, I've lost my mind. They want to sign Talis and they've contacted Palmeiras, whatever you call them. I'm absolutely exhausted today, guys. I'm absolutely exhausted. I'm, I, I completely just messed that up. 
We've contacted the Brazilian club Palmeiras, if that's how you say the club's name, about 19-year-old forward Talis. That's the name of the forward. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely exhausted. So I feel like when I'm talking, I'm just forgetting what I'm saying. So I do apologise if a lot of what I'm saying is not making sense right now. United want to sign the 19-year-old forward Talis, who's at the Brazilian club that Endrick is at. And United have contacted them about figures. United have been scouting a couple of talents in South America, but three or four of them have actually contacted their club about figures and how much they would cost with the goal of buying them and loaning them to Nice. Talis and Anselimo are two players in South America that were looking at signing for United for maybe a 20 million combined and then loaning them to Nice to develop as well uh you go get an ice cream and you're back and chat you know what i might need to get an ice cream because i feel like for the last 10 minutes of this live stream i've been zoning out so if i've said something that's made absolutely no sense and pure waffle i'm falling asleep i do apologize uh as well but um yeah ratcliffe giving you false hope just like he did at nice well he got nice in a bit of a title race at the beginning of the season and they had injuries and and they dropped off a little bit there as well but there is plans for ratcliffe to bring in a good member of staff to oversee a project between united nice and the sun and bringing in south american talents i did a video on that yesterday definitely watch out my watch my video that came out last night if you want all the details on this multi-club network plan and eight of the young talents that any of us are looking at definitely check out last night's video talking about transfers now and i thought this was an interesting story that i'd like to cover um and this is about casemiro and rodrigo says who's a good a good real madrid source said that when manchester united came to real madrid to sign casemiro i remember talking to one of the members of real madrid's board and he told me please please i hope man united buy casemiro as soon as possible they're crazy about money they're going to offer 70 million euros they hoped united would come again with this money for another player Real Madrid basically love Manchester United because they're like, this player's in their 30s. Man United will pay ridiculous money for him and we want to sell him. Real Madrid have bought Chuamene, so they didn't want Casemiro. And Man United probably could have got Casemiro for 20 million cheaper had they really negotiated it with Real Madrid. But because Man United showed their signs of desperation because they'd lost 4-0 to Brentford, um, it was more that actually, you know what, they just went straight up and bought Casemiro for 70 million when they maybe could have got him for 45, 50 million because Real Madrid wanted to sell him. And when you look at Real Madrid, they basically net spend the 15 million to get to a which is absolutely insane. Now, I like Casemiro and I think he was so crucial to our success last season and so important to our success last season. But what I will say on Casemiro is that Ratcliffe doesn't rate the signing. And Ratcliffe actually spoke to John Merchant and said, why are you spending 70 million on a guy that is over 30, giving him that high wages that Real Madrid don't want? You need to stop doing that, United. And that's something that Ineos will probably put in their transfer strategy. I'd probably sell Casemiro to Saudi this summer if we can get some money back for him. But I thought what he did for us last season was amazing. I think he's a top player. But Man United need to stop spending big money on older players. And we need to be going for those 20, 26 year olds, which is what Ratcliffe said to Murta, which I think he's spot on about as well. Guys, we're on 101 likes. So big up everybody who's been hitting that like button. Please do subscribe down below, of course, if you're new as well and all of that stuff. Talking all the latest Manchester United news on the channel. I go live every single day and I do a short video every single day. Two pieces of content a day, one 10-minute video, one sort of 30, 40-minute live stream that covers and gets into all the latest Manchester United news so you guys can stay up to date as well. United helps Chelsea too with uh, Mount. Yeah, we did. We overpaid for Mount. We overpaid for Hoyland. We overpaid for Casemiro. We overpaid for Anthony as well. Um... The sort of a relegation scrap and Nice's season fell apart and he has to sort this club out as well, 100%, because if we want to loan players out to our other sister clubs, they need to be sustainable and a good environment for players to be loaned out to as well. Uh, who do you think would be a better owner? Well, I, the thing is, I don't know. At the time, I thought that, um, you know, Qatar would be the better owners because they're clearing the debt, but you just don't know what's PR and what they would do and what they wouldn't do. Someone said murder madness. Well, that was probably a bit madness from Murta. Now, let's talk about Tenog, because apparently Tenog has urged Surgeon Ratcliffe to have patience with the job he's doing at United and resist any temptation to interrupt the process. Now, if you're not familiar with the reports that's come out this week, there's been a lot of reports coming out this week that basically those at Ineos in particular, Surgeon Ratcliffe and Brailsford, are not impressed by Tenog's recent performances and couldn't believe how bad we were versus Brentford and were also fuming after the Fulham game. Jim Ratcliffe and Brailsford watched the Fulham game, they watched the Brentford game, they're not happy with that and that could influence their decision on Tenog. Now reports are coming out, and I don't know who his sources and who's told him this, that Jim Ratcliffe um, 
Uh, Eric Tenag has urged Jim Ratcliffe to be patient with the job he's doing at United and resist any temptation to interrupt the process. Eric Tenag is trying to convince the surgeon Ratcliffe that he needs time. He knows what he's doing. At the moment, it feels like Eric Tenag doesn't know what he's doing. But at the same time, there's injuries. The players aren't good enough. We know he's a good manager because what he did at Ajax, what he did last season. Will Sergio Ratcliffe sit there and say, I know he's a good manager because of what he's done in the past? Or will Sergio Ratcliffe sack him based off this season? I'm not sure what Sergio Ratcliffe is going to do. But Eric Tenag has urged Sergio Ratcliffe to please avoid temptation and give me patience to do this job, complete this job. And, you know, Arteta got that extra year, Klopp got that extra year. I'd like to see Tenag given that extra year. But I have to say, if we get embarrassed by Chelsea, it's not going to look good for Tenag as well. Ashworth and Wilcox nearly done, but no guarantee they're part of this summer business, which is worrying as well. 100 and likes, 101 likes, people, bigger everybody in the chat as well. And you also need to realise we don't have the squad either. How many of our of our squad get into City, Liverpool and Arsenal start at 11? 100%, 100% agree. I think the thing is, at the end of the day, you can sat to Nog and bring in a new manager. But with the current crop of players that we have, we're not going to improve that much, if, if, if at all, because we don't have great managers that are good, uh, capable of... So Again, I'm tired. We don't have, we have a few great players, but we don't have many players at United that are capable of playing good football consistently and sustainably and that would get into an Arsenal or Manchester City side. That's what I mean. I'm absolutely knackered, so I'm just completely slow in everything I'm saying. I'm messing everything up that I'm saying, so I do apologise. But I want to get into news out of the Chelsea game. It was said that Brown and Evans have passed fitness tests in, in the squad. It's believed that Maguire will be in the squad, so those will be the three centre-back options. So I assume Cambuala will be on the bench. And Ten Hag said on Mason Mount that I don't think Chelsea wanted to sell him. They wanted to keep him and they even offered him a new contract. But he wanted to make the step to United, which is interesting as well. Will Mason Mount feature versus Chelsea? I think because he's been out for so long, as good as he was when he came on, I don't think Ten Hag wants to risk starting him. I think Mason Mount will come off the bench versus Chelsea. And hopefully Mason Mount scores the winner versus Chelsea because that will rattle Chelsea fans. But we've got Moran, we've got Evans for the Chelsea game. Martin is obviously out for the rest of the season. Now, let's dive into Ten Hag's comments he made in his recent presser. Ten Hag says, I know we're not in a good position in regards to United and we have to catch up. And I also know we've had a lot of problems this season. I'm also a realistic man in a competition where the teams are so competitive and it's so close with each other in terms of levels, then you need the players available to make consistent teams um, to bring routines in and play the way that play the way and that depends on results and I think Tanag makes a point Tanag has sort of been frustrating me in sort of post-match interviews when we can see 31 shots to Brentford and he says he's not concerned about it but I think deep down he is concerned about it I think deep down Tanag knows that we don't have the players to play consistently uh, he's saying that when you have to keep playing different lineups it's hard to build consistency I think what is needed at Manchester United is lots of new players coming in something sorting out the medical staff so we get less injuries I think we need players that are able to play the way that Ten Hag wants to play, that can stay fit. He's got the squad available there consistently and, and see what he does with that squad to see if he's a good manager or not. Um, he also said the, that that uh, that is a fact. If you can't do it, you make compromises, you will drop in levels. And when you can't play your consistent team, your when you can play a consistent team, your levels will go up. When you can bring in the best players in your squad, you will collect more points. That is fact. I'll be realistic. Nevertheless, I'll keep fighting till the, till the end of every game and I'll demand a win. Because we're United and we have to win every game, says Ten Hag. But I think that is Ten Hag's way of saying, basically, he, he, things are not doing well at United right now because he hasn't got our stronger squad. And when we do have our stronger squad, we'll look a lot better as well. I'm absolutely falling asleep. I'm abs I'm sorry, I, I do apologise. Alice, you speak fast. Um, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm not making sense today. I'm absolutely knackered. I don't know what's going on with me. I'm, I'm trying to talk and then my mind's just gone. Um, but what was it saying? I was just, yeah, this isn't the best live stream for information because I'm all over the place this morning. But I think with Ten Hag, he's basically saying he wants time. He wants to be given time. He's saying that to Ratcliffe because he's not been able to use our best players this season. We don't have our best squad available. And I don't think we have players to play the way he wants to play consistently as well. Um, I'll keep fighting till the end. Um, I think that's what Ten Hag is sort of thought processes as well um but yeah i, I do apologize if i'm not making a bit of sense today um I, I, i'm a little bit off it today as well people uh people blame um eric Tenard for the price of players but ratcliffe moaning at madness 
yeah, it's not Eric Tenog's fault, the price of players. It's not Eric. Eric Tenog, I know, was willing to spend 85 million on Anthony, but that's not his fault. That shouldn't be his job. If we had a proper sporting director, we wouldn't be saying that. Eric Tenog's trying to convince himself. Eric Tenog is, I think, trying to convince Ratcliffe to give him time. I don't know if Ratcliffe's going to give him time or not, because when you look at the Brentford performance, when you look at the Fulham performance, it's absolutely dreadful. Injuries or not, that's an inexcusable performance from a Manchester United manager. But at the same time, we know that the problem goes beyond the manager. You know, just sacking the manager is not going to change much because we don't have players that are good enough. We know that the problems at United are beyond the manager. We know recruitment needs to improve. There's so much to change that maybe they'll say, look what we did at Ajax, look what we did last season. You know, look at Amorin probably going to Liverpool. Look at, you know, uh, Deserby maybe going to, I don't know, Barcelona. Uh, only realistically on the market is Potter and, and Southgate and Gary O'Neill to replace Tenog. Are they better than Tenog? Actually, well, Tenog's won more in his career. Let's give Tenog one more season like Arteta got. I, I think that's what Ineos might do. And Ineos might say, you know what, the replacements aren't great. Let's give him one more season like Arteta got because we know what he did at Ajax. We know what he did last season. And this season's been bad, but he is saying to me it's because of the injuries, because of this, because of that. We'll judge him off next season. Maybe Ineos do that or maybe Ineos sack him because they just saw how bad the performances were as well. Um, we can call it delusional, but at least trying to stay positive and like Jose's meltdown at the end didn't help anything. Yeah, I mean, I try and be as positive as I can, but it is, it is difficult. It is difficult. And I think with Ten Hag, he's trying to be as positive as he can. But sometimes that doesn't fill fans with confidence because when we're playing badly and Ten Hag's like, oh, there's nothing wrong with the amount of shots we're conceding. We're like, is he going to change that? That doesn't fill us with confidence. Maybe Ten Hag needs to be like, look, yeah, this is an error. We need to work on it. I feel like Ten Hag is, is yeah, and he's, maybe he needs to acknowledge errors more. Uh, cough, cough, performance of players. Yeah, the performance of players has been inconsistent as well, and that's not Tenog's fault. Alice, Manchester United is the only team that can't play well against Brentford. The game was a disgrace, and this is you know, this this is Man this Manchester coach is bad. I don't think Tenog's a bad coach, but I think that Brentford game was a disgrace. I'll agree with you on that as well. Um, uh, I, I hear when running was mentioned, certain Man United players get loud and dance themselves silly. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, to be honest, as well. I wouldn't be surprised as well. The injuries have nothing to do with the medical team, as every team have had an uh, increased injury this season. What job has the players... What job... What jab has all the... That's... No, that's a load of rubbish. That's a load of rubbish. I don't get whenever someone has a problem, people link it to the jab. People have been getting jabs for years for many, many things. You, if you could, if you believe those conspiracies, you're crazy because just as many of them haven't had the jab as have had the jab. I know someone that hasn't had the jab and they've been injured 20, that in real life that I've, that I've played football with that's been injured 24-7 and they haven't had the jab. So it's nothing to do with that. It's to do with the fact that the World Cup was in winter. The I think the injuries is this season is because there's more games. The games are longer because they're adding more minutes on the end of games. And the World Cup meant that no one had a break. And then we've got the Euros this season. And then the pre-season was more hectic than ever. It might be the fact that players are playing more minutes now than ever. Games are more intense now in the Premier League than they used to be. If you look at the distance players have to run in football now compared to 10 years ago, much more. When you look at how many more games and minutes there are and how much longer games are, much more. The increase in injury is nothing to do with a jab. The increase in injury is to do with more minutes, more games being played at more intensity, potentially the medical staff not being as good as they can be, potentially 10 ounce training isn't helping. And obviously some players are injury prone as well. You know, some players are injury prone. Bruno isn't. Look at Bruno. He's a madman as well. Um, so, yeah, um, it's a toxic down, down, downing tool squad think he's figured out they don't handle criticism. That is the one thing I'm with Alex on this. Eric Tenag is always positive after matches. And Eric Tenag is almost sometimes toxic positive after matches in the sense of, you know, we've conceded 31 shots to Brentford and he's saying that's not an issue as long as we don't concede goals. We can, but we they had 85 touches in our box. You know, we conceded 31 shots. But maybe because Ragnick basically just came out and said the players are a disgrace, the players are crap. The players then fell out of Ragnick and bombarded Ragnick out of the club. Maybe Ten Hag is being positive because he knows that we've got players with pathetic, weak mentalities that will cry if you insult them. Maybe that is one of the reasons that Ten Hag is so positive post-match when it's an awful performance. Because I like Ten Hag, I wanted to do well, but sometimes we have these awful performances and then post-match I'm thinking, what is he talking about? This was rubbish. Is he not seeing this? But then I'm also like, is it because he knows the players will cry? Um. So, yeah, we are all crazy. We are all crazy the supporters are also watch too much football 
Uh, Champions in Europa League will have more games next season, so there could be more injuries exactly as well. But guys, I'm going to end up today's live stream because I've been falling asleep a little bit and I feel like I do apologise if there's been a couple periods, but I'm just waffling and not making sense. Sometimes I like start talking and then I forget what I'm saying and then I just start waffling out because I'm falling asleep. And I've done that a bit today where I'm talking fast or I'm trying to get my point across, but then I keep forgetting what I'm saying. So sorry for that like 15 minute blip in this sort of 40 minute show where I've kind of switched off. I'm, I'm, about, I'm back awake again now, but I don't know why I'm so tired today. But listen, please do hit the like on the way out. Do subscribe if you're new. I'll be back tonight for Man United versus Chelsea. Come on, United. Let's get one versus Chelsea. See you then. Bye.